Choose a good place to put your mind. It can be with a breath, thoughts of goodwill. You can meditate on Bhutto, parts of the body. The choice is up to you, because you're looking for a place where the mind can stay and feel engaged. And you're also looking for an antidote. Sometimes with sleepiness, just repeating the word Bhutto, Bhutto, Bhutto helps keep you awake. Or if your mind is drifting and complacent, you can think about death. It's something we don't like to think about, but it's all around us. And it should serve as a reminder. We're not meditating on death to get depressed or discouraged. We're just reminding ourselves this is what happens to everybody, and it's very unpredictable. Yesterday I was visiting a young man who was dying of cancer. And he's got a death sentence on him. But who knows, any of us might die before him. We don't come with an expiry date. And some people actually die in the womb, or they die at the moment of birth. We were fortunate enough to get out and have some time with the world. And the extent to which you have any time, you're fortunate if you use it well. As the Buddha said, one day of insight, one day of concentration, one day of mindfulness is better than a thousand years lived without insight or mindfulness or concentration. Of course, none of us are going to have a thousand years of anything, at least not in this lifetime. And as I said, death can come at any time. Illness can come at any time, strike you down, make it difficult to practice. So we've got the opportunity right now. That's one thing you might want to think about to help the mind settle down. And John Lee often talks about Getting the mind to settle down, not so much with a sense of ease, but from what the Buddhists call sangwega, which can mean the sense of urgency. It can also mean a sense of terror. You look at the world around you and it's just trying to kill you. That year we had the big fire off on the eastern horizon, the whole hillside it seemed to be like a big glowing barbecue grill. And that was the first thought that went through my mind, nature wants to kill us. I'm afraid these days of all the chemicals and other things that are unnatural in our air, in our water, in our food that could kill us. We tend to forget we often die of natural causes. It's the natural thing. That insight the Buddha had in the night of his awakening, in the middle watch of the night, saw all the beings of the universe dying and being reborn based on their actions. And the, the takeaway he took from that was actually two things. One was it answered the question, well, what determines how people are born? And the answer was their actions. Their actions are shaped by their intentions and their views. The other takeaway, of course, was that sense of sangwega. This just keeps going on and on and on, and it's huge. I mean, the entire universe. More than 200,000 people are dying every day here just on Earth. Who knows what's happening with other beings and other realms and other planets around other stars? It's a lot of death. You know, we keep coming back for more. It's that chant we had just now. We're slaves to craving. It never seems to be enough. The story goes that Ratabala, the monk, was talking to King Kauravya about the reasons why it ordained. That's what those Dharma summaries are. And basically he was talking about facts of aging, illness, and death. 
the world is swept away and it's aging. It offers no shelter. There's no one in charge. That's illness. You can't tell other people to share your illness or take it from this person or give it to that person. So the first person gets relieved. It has nothing of its own. That's the fact of death. And yet we keep coming back. That's the clip craving. The story goes that the king wanted that one and just <coughs> explained. And so Ratabal asked him, suppose there were a kingdom off to the east. Lots of wealth, lots of women, lots of all the kinds of things a king would want. And it didn't have much of an army. Your army could conquer it. What would you do? And the king said, well, I take it. Here's the king, 80 years old already. He wants another kingdom. How about if there were a kingdom to the south, or to the west, or to the north, with the same situation? And the king would take those as well. How about if there were another kingdom on the other side of the ocean? He'd go for that, too. It shows how insatiable the human mind is. It keeps coming back from more and more of the same old stuff. When you take a larger view like this, in one way it's a way of taking some of the burden off the mind with your individual problems of the daily life. You realize that you're not suffering alone. Everybody is suffering. And it seems paradoxical, but it's true that thinking about the fact that it's not just you makes it a lot easier to bear the burdens that you do have to bear. Because if it were just you, it would seem unfair. Why me? And even though we know that everybody else has suffering of some sort or another, there's still that question, why me? And the answer is, because it's for everybody. You're a part of everybody. So it gives something of relief about the particulars of suffering, but the general fact of it just gets overwhelming. There's so much all around us. This is why the Buddha in the third watch of his, the night inclined his mind to find a way out. He said it lay in understanding the Four Noble Truths, which meant looking straight at the issue of suffering and looking to see what is the mind doing that keeps coming back, back, back to this. So on the one hand, depersonalizing it helps make it a little easier to bear. And when it's easier to bear, you can look at it with a lot more equanimity and see what are the general patterns here? What? How can I get a handle on the fact that there is suffering here and I can believe it? And part of that lies in realizing that you're adding unnecessary suffering on top of the pain that's, that's already there. That's the motor that keeps things going. As the Buddha said, you have to comprehend the suffering so that you can let it go. And it's not easy to comprehend it until you've got the mind quiet. This too helps to bear a lot of the burdens. The mind gets a lot more still. There's a sense of well-being that comes from within. You don't feel so strung out by the particulars of your suffering. You find there's resources inside you that you can develop. When the mind settles down and gets still, there's a sense of ease. You can spread that ease through the body. This is a really important part of the skill. It's one of the reasons why the Buddha didn't teach a totally one-pointed to the exclusion of all else kind of meditation or concentration. His concentration was more broad-based. You think the breath coming in and out through the whole body, nourishing all the cells throughout the body, nourishing the nerves, nourishing the blood vessels, all the blood in the vessels, all the different organs of the body. And you realize you've got a resource here that you haven't developed properly. It's learning like 
that you have a gold mine, or at least you have a vein of gold under your house. Simply knowing that it's there can give you some sense of security, but even more so when you dig down and find it. The breath element in the body does help in this way. It's the aspect of our inner sense of the body that can be used to adjust all the other aspects. The warmth, the sense of coolness, the sense of heaviness, that tell us that we've got a body. And as the mind seeps throughout the body in this way, your awareness seeps throughout the body, it gets refreshed too. When you're refreshed, that's when you can begin to look at the suffering within you and around you and deal with a, a, with a lot more skill, because you're not quite so much in the line of fire. You can step out a bit. Sometimes it might seem like you're being unfaithful to other people when you're not in the fire line of fire of their suffering, but that's not the case. You're actually helping them by stepping out a bit. You can be a source of strength for them at the same time that you're a source of strength for yourself. Because we all take turns. There are times when we have to depend on other people, there are times when other people have to depend on us. And it's helpful in both cases if you learn how to master those skills that are re referred to in the, the chant on goodwill. May I look after myself with these, may other beings look after themselves with these. If you're more competent in looking after your mind, then no matter how bad the body gets and how much of a burden the body is on yourself and other people, the fact that your mind is in good shape takes a huge weight off of everybody. And at the times when you're the person who has to give the help, the fact that your mind is in good shape means that you're not placing the burden of your grief and your own personal feelings on them. So these are very important skills we're working on here as we train the mind to be still, train the mind to stay concentrated, to develop that sense of well-being in the present moment that doesn't have to depend on things outside. One of the classical images of a person who's fully awakened is a stone pillar, 18 spans tall. Eight spans are buried in the rock of a mountain so that no matter how much the wind blows from whichever direction, the pillar doesn't shiver or shake. Now, when you have a mind like that, can you can rely on yourself, and other people can lean on you, and it's no problem. You give them something secure, and you're not going to fall over. John Lee's image is of a wheel that spins around, but there's something in the center of the wheel, the, sp <clears throat> the spot in the center of the wheel that doesn't spin. That's the pillar. So some sp samsara can spin around, our lives spin around, but try to find that quality in the mind that doesn't spin, that stands solid and tall. And it's both its own support and a place that other people can lean on when, whenever necessary. <clears throat> 